Welcome to ICU Primary Prepcast. Hi, I'm Nari. Hi, I'm Swapnil. And today we are going to discuss about antivirals and antifungals that are commonly used in intensive care unit. Are you ready? Yeah. So, Mary, can you please classify the possible targets of antiviral medications? So, viruses are infectious agents consisting of genetic material, which can be either DNA or RNA, that is then surrounded by a protein coat or capsid, which then in some viruses is also surrounded by a lipid membranous envelope. They are unable to replicate independently and they are obligate intracellular parasites requiring a host cell in order to reproduce. Antiviral therapy targets steps in the virus's infection of cells and their replication. These steps are viral attachment, penetration, uncoating, the synthesis of protein and nucleic acids, and then the virus's assembly and release. So number one, viral attachment. In order to attach, the viral proteins on the capsid or lipid envelope interact with receptors on the host cell surface. This step is blocked by certain antivirals used in HIV, such as enfuviratide and mariviroc, and by the monoclonal antibody palivizumab used for RSV. The second process that antivirals can um, target is viral penetration. So when the virus attaches, it can induce a conformational change in the virus itself, causing fusion of the virus and the host cell membrane, which then allows the virus entry into the cell. This step is blocked by interferon alpha, which is used in the treatment of hepatitis B and C. Thirdly, the virus undergoes uncoating, where the capsid is removed and degraded by enzymes, thus releasing the viral genetic material. This is blocked by imantidine, which is now used for Parkinson's disease and was previously used in the treatment of influenza. The fourth step is protein and nucleic acid synthesis by the virus. This is blocked by drugs like acyclovir or reverse transcriptase inhibitors such as tenofovir and protease inhibitors. The final step is viral assembly and release which is blocked by neuraminidase inhibitors, which is used in influenza. Okay, can you please describe the pharmacology of acyclovir? So acyclovir is a synthetic guanosine analogue, which is used for the treatment of infections caused by the herpes simplex or varicella zoster virus for prophylaxis against these infections in immunocompromised patients and those with frequent episodes of genital herpes as well as for the empirical treatment of encephalitis. Acyclovir shortens the duration of symptoms, time to healing of lesions, and duration of viral shedding in patients with genital herpes, and reduces the frequency of recurrences in those on long-term prophylaxis. If begun within 24 hours after onset of the rash, it also decreases the number of lesions, duration of symptoms, and viral shedding in patients with varicella infections. Its pharmacology can be thought of in terms of its pharmaceutics, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics. Acyclovir is available in tablets of 200 or 800 milligrams as a topical cream for cold sores with 5% concentration, as an eye ointment with 3% concentration, and as an intravenous infusion containing 25 milligrams per mil. The pharmacokinetic can be subdivided into the administration absorption distribution, metabolism, and elimination. In terms of the administration, acyclovir can be given topically to the skin or the eye. It can be given orally and intravenously. However, it has very low oral bioavailability of between 10 to 20%, which decreases further as the dose increases, necessitating higher oral doses. This is not affected by the presence of food. Negligible quantities of less than 0.1% are detected in the urine after topical application to the skin, and small amounts of between 2 to 15% are detected after application to the eye. The d- dose depends on the route and indication, but is between 400 to 800 milligrams orally up to five times a day, or 5 to 20 milligrams per kilo TDS intravenously. 
In terms of the distribution, acyclovir diffuses well into most tissues and fluid in the body. Concentrations in the CSF are about 20 to 25% of serum values, but protein binding is minimal at about 15%. For the metabolism, acyclovir requires three phosphorylation steps in order to become activated. The first is conversion by viral thymidine kinase to acyclovir monophosphate. Secondly, it's converted by host cells to diphosphate compound. And finally, it's converted by the host cell enzymes to the triphosphate, which is the active compound. Acyclovir undergoes some hepatic metabolism by oxidation and hydroxylation to inactive metabolites. In terms of the elimination, after intravenous dosing, 45 to 75% of acyclovir is excreted unchanged in the urine with an elimination half-life of approximately three hours in patients with normal renal function. This half-life increases with age, renal disease, and increasing doses. Elimination occurs mainly by glomerular filtration and tubular secretion, and dose adjustment is required in patients with renal dysfunction. So now coming to the pharmacodynamics, acyclovir triphosphate competes with deoxyguanosine triphosphate as a substrate for viral DNA polymerase, thus getting incorporated into the viral DNA and causing premature DNA, term, DNA chain termination. Acyclovir also competitively inhibits viral DNA polymerase. As acyclovir requires phosphorylation by the viral thymidine kinase, which does not occur in normal cells, it is very specific for infected cells. Acyclovir is more active against HSV compared to varicella zoster, and it is not clinically active against CMV. The most common adverse effects are nausea, vomiting, and rash. The most serious adverse effects include renal toxicity and neurological effects such as seizures, delirium, and coma. Okay, I think the most important point is the dose adjustment in the renal failure. I th- I've seen one patient actually who developed a cyclovir-induced seizures due to toxicity. So again, that's a very important point. So let's move on to the next antiviral drug, that is valacyclovir. Can you please tell us more about it and when is it used? So valacyclovir is the valial ester of the acyclovir, and it's a prodrug. It is rapidly and almost completely converted to acyclovir within the gastrointestinal tract with a bioavailability of 55%, which is three to five times that of oral acyclovir. It is therefore used as an oral alternative to acyclovir in the treatment of and prophylaxis against HSV and varicella zoster. Okay. Now, another very common virus in ICU, especially in in the context of neutropenic sepsis, is CMV. Can you please tell us about which antiviral agents we could use for prophylaxis or for treatment against CMV? So gancyclovir is usually the first-line treatment for CMV or valgancyclovir if oral therapy is indicated. Gancyclovir is an acyclic guanosine analogue that, like acyclovir, requires triphosphorylation in order to be activated. The first step in this process is by a virus-specific protein kinase, thus making it very specific to infected cells. Gancyclovir triphosphate inhibits viral DNA polymerases and has activity against nearly all the herpes herpes virus family but is mainly used for the treatment and prophylaxis against CMV. It is given intravenously, renally eliminated as unchanged drug, and the most significant adverse effects are myelosuppression and renal toxicity. It is contraindicated in pregnancy. Valgancyclovir is the oral prodrug of gancyclovir. Foscarnet can be used in cases where gancyclovir is contraindicated or if CMV resistance is suspected or proven. Foscarnet is a pyrophosphate analogue which inhibits virus-specific DNA polymerase without requiring activation by phosphorylation. It is given intravenously and and has activity against most of the herpes family viruses, but clinically is used for the treatment of CMV or acyclovir-resistant HSV or varicella zoster. The major adverse effects are renal impairment, electrolyte abnormalities, especially hypocalcemia, 
seizures and genital ulcerations. Sudofovir is an alternative to Foscarnet and is a nucleotide analogue which, after cellular phosphorylation, competitively inhibits viral DNA polymerase. As sidofovir has an active metabolite with a prolonged half-life, it can be dosed weekly. It is administered with probenicid to reduce tubular secretion and decrease nef- nephrotoxicity. It does not penetrate the CNS, so should not be used to treat CMV and cephalitis. Okay, now the winter is coming and we all are getting ready for the flu season in Australia and New Zealand. And one of the common antiviral agent that we might consider in that period is Tamiflu or Oseltamivir. Can you please briefly outline the pharmacology of Oseltamivir? So Oseltamivir is a neuraminidase inhibitor, which is used in the prophylaxis against and treatment of influenza. It should ideally be commenced within 48 hours of symptoms onset, as this is when replication of influenza virus peaks. And if given at this stage, it has been shown to reduce the duration of symptoms by one day. However, treatment is often given to patients with severe influenza, with complications from the disease, or those at high risk of poor outcome, regardless of duration of symptoms. Oseltamivir is only available in oral formulations of either 30, 45, or 75 milligram capsules, or as an oral suspension containing 6 milligrams per mil. The dose is 75 mg BD for five days when treating adults with influenza and at a weight-adjusted dose in the paediatric population. The dose is reduced to 75 mg daily for prophylaxis. Oseltamivir is a prodrug which is absorbed in the GIT and converted by hepatic esterases to the active metabolite, which is oseltamivir carboxylate. It has an oral bioavailability of at least 75% and a volume of distribution of between 23 to 26 litres. It has negligible protein binding, and the active metabolite is eliminated entirely by renal clearance. The active metabolite's half-life is 6 to 10 hours, which decreases with renal disease, necessitating dosage adjustment. Oseltamivir carboxylate is a potent and selective inhibitor of influenza virus neuraminidase enzyme. This enzyme is essential for the release of virus particles from infected cells and the further spread of the virus within the body. Adverse effects are uncommon but include headache, nausea and vomiting. So folks, that was mainly about the antiviral agents commonly used in intensive care unit. Now let's switch our focus to antifungal agents. Maddie, can you please list the main classes of antifungal agents used for systemic fungal infections and their mechanism of actions and an example of each. So fungi are eukaryotic organisms that are heterotrophs, which is that they cannot make their own food. There are four main classes of antifungal agents used for systemic fungal infections. These are polyenes, azoles, echinocandins and pyrimidine analogues. Polyenes bind to ergosterol, which is a sterol that is a vital part of the fungal cell membrane. In contrast, human cell membranes have cholesterol as their predominant sterol. By binding to ergosterol, it alters the permeability of the membrane, resulting in the formation of pores, leakage of intracellular contents, and eventual death. Examples include amphotericin B and nystatin. The second class are azoles. These work by inhibiting the fungal cytochrome P450 enzyme, 14-alpha-demethylase. This enzyme is required for the conversion of lanosterol to ergosterol in the fungal cell membrane. There are two main groups, the imidazoles, such as clotrimazole, and the triazoles, such as fluconazole and voriconazole. The third group are echinocandins, which work by inhibiting the synthesis of beta 1 to 3 glucan, which is an essential component of the fungal cell wall. Examples include anadula fungin, casperfungin, and mycofungin. And finally, pyrimidine analogues. The only member of this class is flucytosine. 
It is taken up by fungal cells and converted to 5-fluorouracil, which interferes with fungal DNA and protein synthesis. It is not used as a single agent due to the rapid development of resistance, but is used in combination with amphotericin B or an azole. Okay, so let's dive deeper into a few azoles that we use in intensive care unit. Can you please outline the spectrum of activity indications and key differences in pharmacology of boriconazole, posaconazole, and fluconazole? So fluconazole, voriconazole, and posaconazole are all triazole antifungal agents, but have varying spectrums of activity. Fluconazole is a first-generation agent, which is active against yeast, including Canada species and cryptococcus, but is in, in, ineffective against aspergillus. Resistance to fluconazole is encountered in many non-albicans candida species, such as candida glabrata. It is indicated for the treatment of candidiasis, such as vaginal or esophageal, for the, for the treatment of systemic candida infections, for cryptococcal meningitis or tinea that is not on the scalp or nails, and for antifungal prophylaxis against yeast infections in immunocompromised patients. Voriconazole and posaconazole are second-generation triazoles with extended spectrum of activity against aspergillus, scidosporium, and fusarium species. Voriconazole is a first-line treatment for aspergillosis and is used in the treatment of fluconazole-resistant candida infections and for prophylaxis against mold infections in immunocompromised patients. Posaconazole is the broadest spectrum azole and has similar activity to voriconazole, but is the only azole effective against the agents of mucormycosis. It is used for the same indications as voriconazole, but also for the treatment of mucormycosis. All three agents are available in oral and intravenous formulations. Both fluconazole and voriconazole are well absorbed orally with bioavailabilities of over 90%, whereas po posaconazole's oral absorption is variable at approximately 50%, but this increases in the presence of food. Fluconazole is minimally protein bound at about 10% and is widely distributed into body tissues and fluids, achieving good penetration into the CSF. Both voriconazole and posaconazole have much larger volumes of distribution and are more highly protein bound at 56 and 96% respectively. The majority of fluconazole is eliminated unchanged by the kidneys, therefore dose adjustment is required in renal dysfunction. Its long serum half-life of 24 hours allows for once daily dosing, whereas both posaconazole and voriconazole is usually given in divided doses. The serum concentrations of posaconazole increase with more frequent administrations, so it is sometimes given four times a day. Posaconazole undergoes about 15% hepatic metabolism, but is mainly eliminated unchanged in the feces, with about 13% excreted in the urine. In contrast, voriconazole undergoes mainly hepatic elimination, with less than 2% being excreted by the kidneys. Therefore, voriconazole requires dose reduction in cirrhosis, whereas fluconazole and posaconazole do not. Both voriconazole and posaconazole can be given orally in patients with renal failure, but their use is not recommended intravenously if the creatinine clearance is less than 50 ml per minute. All three drugs are inhibitors of isoenzymes in the cytochrome P450 system, thus have multiple drug interactions. However, of these, fluconazole has the least effects on these enzymes, thus has less drug interactions. Voriconazole exhibits non-linear pharmacokinetics, and some of its toxicities are associated with higher doses. Therefore, monitoring of voriconazole levels is often undertaken. Adverse effects include alopecia, visual, visual changes, hallucinations, Steven Johnson syndrome, hepatotoxicity, and long QT interval. Fluconazole has low toxicity but can also cause prolonged QT interval and hepatotoxicity, although more commonly it causes gastrointestinal side effects. It also seems to enhance the bactericidal action of neutrophils. Posaconazole is probably the best tolerated of the three and has minimal adverse effects. 
okay so when there is a problem with uh, resistance with to azoles or if there is a contraindication to azoles we end up in using the other antifungal agents in intensive care unit those are amphotericin b and anidula fungin can you please describe the spectrum of activity and the significant toxicities that we should be aware of in regards to amphotericin B and anidula fungin? So amphotericin B is a polyene antifungal and has the broadest spectrum of activity of all the antifungal agents. It is active against yeast, including candida and cryptococcus, organisms causing endemic mycosis, and the pathogenic mold such as aspergillus and agents causing mucormycosis. It is not active against some species of aspergillus such as A. terius or nigilans. However, its use is associated with significant toxicity, including infusion-related reactions such as phlebitis and rigors, and renal issues such as nephrotoxicity, renal tubular acidosis, electrolyte abnormalities, and anemia. Anadula fungin is an echinocandin and is active against candida species but has minimal activity against cryptococcus or aspergillus. It is used for the treatment of invasive candidiasis and in critically ill patients. Anadula fungin is well tolerated with minimal adverse effects, but these include GI upset and flushing. Okay, Maddie. So I think that was the last question. Now, as you know, I'm in Boston and it's already 11 o'clock in the night. I hope you don't ask any questions tonight and kind of spare me from this exercise. No, I have to. It's the best part. <laughs> we can continue to argue on that one, but <laughs> let's go ahead. Okay. Okay. So why did the fungi leave the party? Oh my goodness. Um, fungi leave the party. Oh, because they're not invited? No, because because there wasn't much room. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mary. That was a really good joke. So, folks, this was the end of our podcast on antiviral and antifungal agents. Uh, so that completes the whole podcast series on antibiotics as such. Next time, we'll be back with the podcast on local anesthetics and steroids. Till then, goodbye and have a good time. Thanks for listening. See you next time.